Hello, everyone. Welcome to this event, CNA Leadership Summit 2022. Happy International Women's Day. My name is Dawn Tan. I co-present Asia tonight and Singapore tonight. They are two of CNA's flagship bulletins that you may have seen. They're on every night. Also Money Mind, that's on once a week. It's a personal finance program. I'm the host of that show. Now for this session, I am very pleased to have with us Ms. Maria Ressa, joint Nobel Peace Prize laureate for our next fireside chat. Maria is dialing in all the way from the Philippines and we are so honored to be able to have her here with us today. If you want to post a question to Maria at all, you can do so. Again, it's on the Pigeonhole website that you may have downloaded, www.pigeonhole.at. The password again, just a quick reminder, CNA8MAR, and we will try our best to get to your questions should you have them. Now, Maria, she is well known to us all. The co-founder of Rappler.com, she is the CEO, she is the executive editor of this new site based in the Philippines. We're fortunate she's here and that we have this opportunity to talk to Maria. She is an inspiration to so many women, yours truly included. A journalist for 35 years, she has a wealth of experience behind her, well qualified to speak on things to do with journalism and to do with uh, the triumphs as well as the tribulations she has faced on that journey. She's had her fair share of both of those. But challenge is what you face, I think, when you're doing journalism right. And so Maria has a great position being able to tell us something about that journey. She was one of Time's Persons of the Year for 2018, Time's 100 Most Influential People for 2019. She has been honored around the world for her courageous work, the work we know well, fighting disinformation, fake news, attempts to silence the free press. Now, do we have Maria? There she is, Maria. Let's all give her a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Maria, thank you so much for joining us here today. It is an absolute pleasure to see you in your space, that space that's become so well known to so many of us around the world. Now, Maria, as we celebrate International Women's Day, there is an exodus of women, of children, of the elderly, most of them women and children, may I add. They're leaving their homes, they're leaving their land, they're leaving their democracy behind. President Vladimir Putin has, in recent days, criminalized the process of independent journalism in Russia. He's criminalized the use of the, of the term war. Now, your fellow Nobel laureate, and you will know this, Maria, Dmitry Muratov has stopped his newspaper, Novaya Gazeta, from reporting on this invasion, this attack, this war, as a war, for fear of repercussions. Now, you've said that you believe Russia is attempting to destroy the truth. What is your message today to the world, Maria, as we witness the silencing of Russia's independent media? So first of all, thank you so much for having me and Don. I mean, I so wish I could be in Singapore with you in that room. Um, uh, my gosh, let me let let me first phrase in terms of the big picture. You know how this moment is incredibly critical for the entire world, not just for journalists, right? You're only we're only talking about the information that you get, but essentially this moment, the first. Land the first invasion that's happened really for decades, right? I mean, since World War II, I suppose, but although you have Georgia in between, um, this is going to reinvent geopolitical power. Right now, as we speak, 
countries are aligning, realigning, companies are realigning, companies are taking position. We have not seen the world act with this unity and speed in many ways um, in a very, very long time. And in many ways, it is actually, I hate to say this, but you know, please keep in mind, I am ultimately an optimist in everything. And when I accepted the no when when I was doing the Nobel lecture, I actually said that it, it's like an atom bomb has exploded in our information ecosystem because that is what we are facing: the corruption of facts, the corruption of truth, the the breaking of our shared space through social media. Well, what this has happened, what ha this has done, what Putin has done is to force a confrontation. It's a confrontation the world doesn't want and a confrontation that could lead to some horrific uh, ends if we all don't handle it carefully, gingerly, empathetically, right? But what it will do is define exactly what our information ecosystem is going to begin to look like. So, for example, take a look at what the technology platforms are doing to Russian disinformation. Take a look at how people have used social media for good. That's been a long time coming, right? And for the first time in a long time, the master at social media information operations or information warfare, Russia, has actually been pushed to a back. Like they, they're on a defensive right now. Um, Putin forced to actually ban uh, Meta or Facebook, right? So I think this is the the short answer is these moments, these next few weeks, these hopefully not months, but the the very painful time we are living through is going to determine what our world is going to look like. That's one. Two, of course, the journalists Dmitry Muratov uh, and other Russian journalists including the foreign press, many of whom have pulled out of Russia into safer spaces and will continue to report from, from these safer spaces. You know, this is also going to define new lines. Um, no country has been such a pariah as Russia is becoming now, but the world will also feel that in terms of its economic impact, the price of oil already going up to 100, more than 139 dollars per barrel, right? So these are things that we have to deal with. But Dimitri made a choice, you know, and it was a choice that was necessary if he wanted to keep operating in Russia. Um, others chose to leave, others chose to shut down. These are the kinds of choices increasingly journalists around the world are being forced to make. When we run into the different choices that we have to make, uh, Maria, it is often difficult, and history has, has shown us that there will be that, that pathway, those hits and those misses. Historically, democracy has been good for women, and th that's what we're celebrating today, International Women's Day. But we do run into some serious issues when we begin to look at how information is used, and that's something that you know a great deal about, Maria, how autocracies perhaps use information to, to shape and to mold our reality. And let's face it, it happens to us even in democracies. We want to establish and, and sort of uh, you know, connect our narratives so that they, mean, they, they make sense to us every day, who's winning, who's losing, and so on. So disinformation in the hands of the powerful has devastating effects, Maria. What's the risk for democracy in 2022? We're seeing the breakdown of democracies all around the world. And, you know, I became a journalist because I believe that information is power, and it really is. And that information ecosystem is the foundation of everything in our societies, right? So if you just follow that, we agree on the facts that becomes our shared reality. And then we negotiate within that shared reality to create things, whether, you know, and to, to find solutions to problems, whether it is uh, climate change or how to deal with coronavirus, we must agree on the facts. The biggest problem we have today is that the information ecosystem, the gatekeepers have changed. And I'll peg it back to 2014 as the kind of the year where we saw it change, right? When traditional news organizations like Channel News Asia, like, well, Rappler was born on the internet, but, you know, we're, 
we have the kind of same standards and ethics. Um, 2014, the invasion of Crimea, annexation, let me use the right word. <laughs> so when Russia moved into Crimea was really the first time where we saw this kind of methodology that has attacked every democracy, every country around the world, every country, every user around the world that uses these giant American and Chinese social media platforms, right? So if you think about it like this, these bottom-up exponential attacks or lies, uh, and then it's made, it comes top down. So your meta narrative is seeded years earlier, even if it's a lie, you say it a million times, it becomes a fact. This is part of what it's, it's in the age of information abundance, we never expected that this could be the case, right? So you say it a million times, people begin to believe it. And then if authority comes top down, then it becomes reality. And this we saw in Crimea uh, in 2014, in May of 2014, one of the, like the, the most famous information operations, a fake account on Facebook pretending to be a doctor, posts that were, and it was both Facebook and Twitter, posts that were translated in, into multiple languages claiming that Jews in Odessa, that Nazis were coming after them, and that, you know, this was uh, this essentially what Putin said eight years later when he invaded the Ukraine. Um, so it was pumped out. People began to, to take it, and it was still relatively new in 2014. You know, you kind of, do you believe it or not? But then here's the kicker. Um, the next day, exactly a day later, the same exact message is comes out of the mouth of of Russia's foreign minister, uh, Minister Lavrov, at the United Nations. So I peg that as a point when we saw mul dual realities, multiple realities impact geopolitical power play. And we've seen that in every country around the world. Singapore is part of uh, a group that is of ministers who are working on, on disinformation, on how to deal with this, what kind of legislation is necessary. Singapore has put in place, may not be the best one, but the point here is that disinformation is now a weapon of war. Information operations. Again, I'm going to quote a Russian former head of the KGB. His name is Yuri Andropov. He said, and this name disinformation came from disinformatia. He said, disinformatia is like cocaine. You take it once or twice and you're, you're okay. But if you take it all the time, you become an addict, a changed person. I'm paraphrasing what he said, but essentially we have been living like cocaine addicts. If you take Andropov's, we live in an information ecosystem where uh, lies spread like viruses. And the system itself, actually is designed to spread lies laced with anger and hate faster and further than facts. Um, that's social media today, and that is part of the critical problem we need to deal with. I'm sorry I haven't really answered your question, because I think this is very fundamental, but to answer your question, here's what happened. In a situation like that, who were the first people attacked, and who were the most vulnerable? So journalists around the world are attacked, but women in the Philippines, for example, you know, uh, my government filed uh, 10 arrest warrants in less than two years against me. This is my 36th year as a journalist. So I'm old. I have gray hair, you know, um, but shocking, still shocking, right? Because I'm just doing my job. Um, and what we saw in the Philippines is that women are attacked online at least 10 times more than men. So online, you have women, any group that is already vulnerable, the LGBTQ, they are attacked more online and need, and in many ways, we've taken many steps backwards from where we used to be before social media, before technology became the gatekeepers into our information ecosystem. Maria, that flurry of mis and disinformation that you speak about and the the repercussions of that on women and on communities in general. What happens though, when the currency of lies becomes equal to truth? Because the assumption is, well, we all want the truth, don't we? Not everybody wants the truth. 
What do we do? How do we fix that? So think about it like this. I'll start with the design, right? And how it's, we have gotten to a place that we could never have fathomed in the age of scarcity of information, right? In the age of scarcity of information, when, when news groups were the gatekeepers, it was, you know, the idea was that the more information, the better. That's no longer the case, right? What happened when it became information abundance is that the psyche, our psychology, our minds were the ones that were targeted. And when it came to a point where a lie told a million times becomes a fact, that actually is true. Research has shown that all around the world. And as early as 2018, an MIT study did show that lies spread faster than facts. So you can actually say that by design, these platforms that now deliver the news, you know, please make no mistake, Facebook is the world's largest delivery platform for news, right? But they're biased against facts and they're biased against journalists. Why do I say that? Because the end goal of all of these platforms is to keep you scrolling on the platform, right? So how do they do that? By serving you, using algorithms to serve you content that will keep you, the new word, engaged. Except what that does is just to serve you a lie laced with anger and hate that will keep you angry and spreading that anger and hate. This is part of the kind of emergent human behavior that is happening. Let me just simplify it like this. An idea of polarization of society, right? Singapore government notes this in particular, that if you have a very diverse society, you want to make sure that you keep them, that you unite, right? Well, in this one, something very simple, an algorithm. So let's, you know, what is an algorithm? It's opinion in code. Opinion that can be served by a machine multiple times, millions of times. So something as simple as how do we grow our social media networks? The algorithm, Facebook, and every social media platform use this friends of friends. So if you are in the Philippines in 2016, and you can, you can substitute the United States, you can substitute any country where a polarizing leader has been elected democratically. If you're in the Philippines in 2016, that was when President Duterte was elected, he used an us against them kind of leadership, right? Demonizing another side. So here we were in 2016, we didn't debate the facts, but using the friends of friends algorithm to grow your networks, you saw this is what happened. If you're pro-Duterte, you moved further right. If you're anti-Duterte, you moved further left. That's 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021. That's what algorithms do, right? Uh, and then there's also, if you look at the research on YouTube, for example, the, the, the push towards more radicalism, extremism. This is built into the design of the platforms. So that growth becomes exponential. It grows in and of itself. Uh, you, you speak about President Duterte, and I want to mention him because, you know, when I think about the Philippines, I think about its long history of uh, colonialism. I think about the hundreds of years that it had before that, 300, over 300 years of it. But it does mean that the Philippines has a relatively young democracy. And, and, a, and an important one to protect. So you've got these young, energized people. You've got an election process that's going on. You also have a presidential front runner who, during this uh, Ukraine invasion, has said he didn't feel that he needed to take a stand. Now, this is at the point of which he knows he's a front runner. He may well win. We don't know. But he says, I don't need to take a stand. We're not involved in this war. I don't think there's anybody who hasn't felt that they needed to take some kind of a position on, on, on this Russian invasion. But do you believe that the people of Southeast Asia should care about what we're seeing play out in the headlines, this invasion, and, and arguably, you know, for what was a healthy democracy? Ukraine was a healthy democracy. They, they voted for their leaders. And of course, the first war on European soil in, that we've seen in decades. 
Yeah. Um, so first, I think that um, the front runner in our presidential elections on May 9th, this is Ferdinand Marcos Jr., actually changed his position just at the end of last week. I think over the weekend, he then, he then said that uh, he condemned the invasion of Ukraine along with the Philippine government. Um, look, here's a great saying about the Philippines. You mentioned our history. Um, the joke is that you know the Philippines spent 300 years in a convent and 50 years in Hollywood. 300 years colonized by Spain, and then we were uh, the, the United States came in. We were a protectorate, a colony of the United States for 50 years. Um, so let me pull it back to this, right? This information and then our presidential campaign. What we have seen is that uh, our history can be changed in front of our eyes. Um, in plain view, disinformation networks, uh, they're called information operations when power uses it to change the way people think. You know, I've, I've long said now that social media has become a behavior modification system because of these algorithms that allow you to micro-target groups, not just in the Philippines, but everywhere around the world. Imagine micro-targeting um, specific messages that no one else sees. So what's been going on since 2014 is really kind of a a whitewashing of our history. Remember in 1986, the People Power Revolt ousted Ferdinand Marcos, the father of our front runner. And uh, it, it sparked all these pro-democracy movements all around the world. And here we are 36 years later and Ferdinand Marcos Jr. is a front runner, right? And part of the reason that has happened is because we've seen two things, um, networks of disinformation that slowly chipped away uh, and it went hand in hand, a perfect storm with the lack of our history books. You know, people looked away. So now we believe that Marcos, the father, was actually a hero. He has, by decree of President Duterte, been buried in the hero's cemetery. Um, and people don't know what history is. That's shocking. It's similar, again, to what Putin had tried to do in justifying the invasion of Ukraine. If you watched his long rambling justification and speeches, these are the same kinds of narratives that were seeded on social media, on Twitter, by both bots and then kind of, you know, the, the GRU and the IRA, these are from 2016 down. I think here in the Philippines, what's fascinating now, and, you know, of course I'm in the middle of, of all of this, and I use the word fascinating because I feel like we are at this existential moment where we will determine not just our future, but our past. And the biggest question that you have to have for every country with elections this year, when there are still no guardrails around these godlike technologies, where the profit motive of these social media, these American companies, are actually driving distribution of news are driving our realities. So without that, how can you have integrity of elections? It's a question I asked in the Nobel lecture. You can't have integrity of elections if you don't have integrity of facts. That's where our shared reality begins to fall apart. And you know, I, I'll say again, uh, the Philippines will have elections May 9th. Shortly after that, you have elections in, in countries like Hungary, you have Kenya, countries where, you know, democracy is as highly contested. Um, Brazil, Bolsonaro comes up again uh, in October, I believe. And then, of course, you have the U.S. elections. So this is a critical year for the vote. But the question I always ask now is, how free are we? You know, have the social media platforms gotten to a point where they really are a behavior modification system. And we now have to demand that the use of our data pulled together by machine learning not be used to insidiously manipulate us. And Maria, you have spoken about that. You've spoken about the need for us to, to have more of that data. We need to have access to that. And specifically for journalists, as an example, to have 
fuller access to that data. You, sp you speak about the guardrails, perhaps, that might be needed. What would those guardrails look like for you? It's a great question, Don. I mean, and, and you know, I've testified in many of the countries that are, that are rolling out legislation, in particular, the, uh, the European Parliament this month will be rolling out, uh, will be voting on the Digital Services Act, which is part of its democracy action plan. Um, the UK has its online safety bill, and the US has long been debating um, this kind of Section 230. Uh, it's a part of its Communications Decency Act that allows tech platforms to actually spread lies. You know, they're not responsible for the content that is spread on their site. It's kind of like a imprimatur, it's like a license to print money at the expense of the harms on the people on these platforms. And you know, make no mistake, you're talking about unprecedented numbers globally on platforms connected to each other. We've never had this before. You know, almost three billion just on Meta's accounts on its uh, if you combine Facebook and WhatsApp. All right, so so what are we looking at um you know sorry please can you tell me ask me the question again so of course i'm like sitting there the guardrails the guardrails but, maria we need the guardrails we yes, need yes, yes. we want to be able to have that access to data uh, what more can we do though because that's always been the question is the onus on the big tech companies to be to be pressed by by laws to, to have to obey new laws that actually will protect us finally because we didn't have any protection when this whole experiment called the internet came to be. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, let me put it this way. Um, the advertise if you think about all of these platforms now, they've become advertising companies. That is how they make most of their, their revenues. A, a system called surveillance capitalism, a, a huge book by uh, Harvard professor emeritus Shoshana Zuboff. Um, so what happens is all of us are down here looking at content. That's where we wind up debating it. And most of the early legislation, I think including Singapore's, is looking at content. But that's the wrong place to look. It's not the content that you want to actually regulate because then you step on, you could be stepping on free speech issues. You want to move further upstream. And this is where you have the algorithms of distribution. This isn't a free speech issue as much as a, it is a distribution issue, right? What actually is coded in those algorithms of distribution. What bias, you know, the fact that they spread lies, lace with anger and hate faster and further. And then, so think about it like this, you go up one more step to the actual business model. And this business model takes everything you post on their platforms, brings all of that together, uses machine learning to give you, to create a model of you that knows you better than you know yourself. So now there's this model of you and me and everyone who uses the platform here. That's the, that's the model called surveillance capitalism. And that model is what is being used to determine how to target you, how to be able to micro-target you with advertising. So where do you want legislation? In these two areas, not here. When you look at these two areas, you can target them in two ways, right? You look, at, they have to be, greater transparency in terms of the behavior that they are creating because they're coding it in and it is by machine. You know, imagine one editor's decision multiplied millions of times. That's what the machine does. So we would, this is part of what DSA demands is more transparency on that. The second thing is accountability. Who really is accountable for genocide in Myanmar, for example, you know, for fomenting hate in human beings. Again, Singapore knows this better than any other country, right? You do not want to have a spark, create ethnic conflict. But in many ways, that is what the social media platforms are actually doing, right? It's almost like it, it gags. You know, there's this old cartoon when I was growing up, there's a devil and angel on your shoulder and it's in your head, they whisper things to you. In your head, you try to make the right choices, except with social media, the angel is gagged and flicked off your shoulder and the devil becomes, you know, tens of feet tall and given a megaphone directly into your head, right? That's the world we live in today. 
I'm so sorry to keep going on about these information ecosystems, but you have to understand that being a journalist today, when we create content, that isn't the determining factor. Distribution is, and distribution of that content is now in the hands of these tech companies that decide to distribute based on profit. That's a fundamental difference in the world, and we need to address that. I think many journalists rue the day that journalism became defined by content creation. And I, I think that as a journalist myself, with many years of experience from very long ago, and it is a very long, long time ago, uh, journalists aren't content creators. That isn't true. Uh, yes, you need to create content, but uh, I, I, I would hope that the next generation of journalists don't think of themselves as content creators, because that would really ruin, it would ruin the, the, the history of, of what you really do, uh, Maria. Maria, we, we're running out of time. I know I've been, um, I, I want to get to a question that, on that. Some have said that they, that, uh, they feel that you may be idealistic, Right? And maybe you even feel that at some level you're idealistic. But you've had, of, of anyone, when you talk about, okay, it's International Women's Day, when you talk about the attacks, networked misogyny as an example, no one has been hit more than Maria Ressa. Nobody on this planet. If you actually know how social media has targeted her and on what levels, you've had all of these threats against you. You have outstanding cases that face you. Tell us what challenges you go through to hang on to your ideals. I am idealistic, and I want to stay idealistic. Look, I mean, I'm already, I'm old. I'm in my, well, why not? I don't mind. I'm 58 years old this year, right? I'm going to turn 59, and yes, I believe in the good. And that's despite being a journalist who's seen all the bad. Right, because in the bad, I've always seen such generosity of spirit. You know, like it, there's, I have a thing in my computer where there's this gentleman who inevitably, when I was still reporting for CNN, there would be a typhoon, and there's this area that always gets his home gets demolished every year. And I would land, and there he would be sitting, and he would offer us whatever he had. There is always the good. Um, Look, I think that you have to be idealistic, whether you're a journalist, whether you're a business, whether you're in government, because if you're not, how are you able to actually let go of your own selfishness and try to work for the greater good? That's the mission of journalism, right? I, I, why do, how can I still be idealistic? Because I've seen it. Rappler, by all accounts, probably should have been shut down in 2018 when the government took away, they tried to take away our license to operate, but we continue to fight and we are fighting it in court. I intend to win these cases in court, but we couldn't have done this alone. You know, I believe that people see the good. And I think that, you know, that's part of what we want to, I guess, our shared humanity is what makes it so special and so magical. And here's the part on International Women's Day. People always tell you that, you know, women are weak or, you know, that you have to be a certain way to be strong. Mm -hmm. When I first started reporting for CNN, my boss sent back my tape. This is back in the days when it would take two weeks to get a tape back and forth, right? And he sent it back and he said, you know, you sound, you, you're, you look too young, you sound weak, so go drink some uh, brandy and make your voice deeper. This was, so this was the training I got, right? <laughs> anyway, um, what it did do for me is you realize that everyone has stereotypes of strength, but the real strength comes from within. And I find women actually possess a particular strength that holds not just, you start with a family, but you also move forward. You need empathy that women bring in. And of course, men also have this, but I guess 50%, you know, you hold up half the sky. So on International Women's Day, I think we're at this moment again where we need to reassess what strength means at a time when lies and bombastic kind of statements are crowding out our humanity. 
And we have to go back to that because that is how we will get through this time period, remembering our shared humanity and remembering our vulnerabilities and having empathy for each other. Maria, I know that somewhere on a mood board at Rappler.com, there, there are some words that have been scrolled there saying power is female. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Maria Ressa, CEO of Rappler.com. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.